planning this um, forum, we took a little field trip and had a meeting there at a second cup. And they, they sell good stuff and it's a lovely place. So um, I want to also, before I introduce our last speaker, want to remind you we, we're going to have a, a brief question and answer period. And then you can go over to our fellowship hall and these people will be there to answer questions one-on-one. -on -one. They, they'll have some literature. So, and we also, uh, please fill out your evaluations. We very much value your, um, your feedback on this. Our last person is Bailey Hall with The Landing. Hello, hello, are y'all still with us? <laughs> All right, so as, as she said, my name is Bailey Hall. I'm a case manager at The Landing. So I'm gonna get more into what The Landing is later, more in, de in detail about what we do, where we're located, how we got started. Um, but we're a drop-in center that is located in the southwest part of Houston. Um, we're in one of the main hotspots for prostitution in Houston, um, and we are serving survivors there. So before I talk more about The Landing, I want to um, talk about drop-in centers and tell you a little bit about what those are and why we've selected this model, uh, why we believe it's most effective for this population. Um, so if we can get to the slides over here. So I know y'all have seen a lot of statistics tonight, so I'm just gonna do a quick slide with statistics because there's one I really want y'all to see on here. Um, so David, if you'll hit the next one. Okay, so you've seen before the 313,000, which Personally, I believe that is extremely low. Um, I believe there's far more than that, but as Dale and everyone has said before, it is um, extremely clandestine, it's very hidden, it's hard to get these numbers. Um, these numbers actually come from a UT study that was done in 2015. Uh, it's the most used numbers for the state of Texas because it's one of the only studies that's been done in Texas, unfortunately. Um, there's more happening now, but this is one of the only ones we have, so more, Research needs to be done so we can get more accurate numbers and then get more services and more, um, more resources for these clients. So the main one I want you to see here is that of the 313 uh, victims of, of human trafficking in Texas, less than 2% have been identified. Less than 2%. So that means only 2% of that number are that are even aware, the, sorry, the service providers are even aware that they're there um, or that they've been um, identified as a, as a victim. So drop-in centers seek to change that number. We want to work on the identification piece because if they're not being identified, then they're not going to be getting the services that are available to them. Even if we've got lots of services available, they won't know where to find us, we won't know where to find them. So identification is a huge part of why uh, we opened a drop-in center. So if you go to the next one. So you've seen this map before. Um, these are just different hotspots within Houston. Um, it's happening all over the place, but these are just hotspots for where prostitution cases and human trafficking cases have been found. If you notice that one in the far southwest corner right there, where Beltway 8 and 59 meet, we're located right in that circle. Um, so if you go to the next slide. Um, so we can, you can go ahead and put all the pieces here. So Erica's already talked about why Houston has a problem here. Um, and for a while we've been known as a city that um, has a human trafficking problem, but now we're, being, we're starting to be known as a city that is fighting human trafficking. And all the people who have presented tonight are a part of that, and all of you can be a part of that too. Um, so we're not just gonna be known as the city that has a human trafficking problem, we're gonna be known as the city that's leading the fight for it, um, the fight against it. So some of the models that are already existing to serve um, survivors are emergency shelters like the Salvation Army, um, there's different domestic violence shelters that serve victims of human trafficking. And then there's also long-term safe homes all around the country that will take survivors from uh, Houston and other areas as well. Um, these are great models for the victims who have been identified. But again, only less than 2% have been identified. So what do we do for everyone else? 
Um, if you go to the next slide. So a drop-in center seeks to fill that gap between the streets and the shelters, because that is a very large gap for somebody who's been in the life, as it's, as it's referred to, um, to go to a shelter is sometimes a jump they're not able or not capable or willing to make at the time. So in the in the in between, we serve to be there as a publicly accessible safe space um, to really get that identification piece. Um, so the the we have based our um, reasoning for having a drop-in center on evidence for drop-in centers that have been done before. Um, and these key pieces, when they are present, having case management and accessible space, and for us, accessible means by foot, because most of our clients don't have a car or anything, so we wanted to be in walking distance for them. Um, collaboration with other communities, other service providers, for anything that we can't provide in-house, we're gonna refer out somewhere. Um, having boundaries and structure in our program, having room for activities, and skilled and genuine staff. All of our staff are trained in trauma-informed care and an understanding of what our clients have been through and how it's gonna affect the way that we interact with them. So when, these evi when those evidence-based practices are present, the outcomes that are seen are increased ability to set goals, they retain relationships and build support networks, which are crucial for being able to make an exit from the life, um, finding work and developing self-confidence when they're participating in classes and doing things that they did not believe they were capable of doing before. Having an overall increased well-being, access to health services, reduced drug use, and greater housing stability. Okay, so for the landing, um, when were we started? We are only three and a half years old, so we started January of 2016. Um, where, if you go to the next slide, like I said before, we're right in the center of that hot spot. Um, Bisso, as we were talking about earlier, that's the main track, and we are right off of Bissonette Street. That's the street right there. Um, so, like I've said before, most of our clients don't have access to a car or any way to get there besides on foot. So they're just walking up on the street, off of the street, coming into the building, and getting services. We're located in an office building. Uh, we don't have a standalone building. We're in a sixth floor suite of an office building, and that's for a couple reasons. One is for anonymity. So anyone walking into the building, you're not gonna know that they're part of the life that they're coming for the landing. They could be going for a doctor's office in the building or for a rehab center in the building, or um, I think there's a tax company in the building. It could be for anything. So anonymity for our clients, as well as security and safety. Uh, we do recognize that there are a lot of traffickers in the area and um, that can present a safety problem. So we take extra safety measures, having um, all of our doors locked and having cameras on our doors and having a lot of protocol in place to make sure our staff, our clients, and our volunteers are all safe. Um, so why? Our mission is to serve survivors of human trafficking with a trauma-informed approach fueled by the love of Christ. Um, sorry, I missed the commercial sexual exploitation piece as well. Uh, the reason that we include that in, our, in um, our mission is because we don't just want to serve people who can identify as human trafficking victims. A lot of our clients don't know what human trafficking is. They don't know that term. And so we ask a blanket question for um, criteria to be in our program is if you've ever exchanged sex for anything of value. So that could be shelter. You, you were forced to have sex to, to have a place to stay that night, to have food to eat. Um, it doesn't have to be identified as human trafficking, just as long um, as they're a part of that, that population, then we can offer them services. Um, so we operate off of the stages of change model. And this is a really important model because it shows um, just the different places that people have to get to before they can always make that exit. Um, we want to meet people where they're at. So if they're in the pre-contemplation stage, they may not even be thinking about leaving the life. They may just be coming in to get some food, clothing, hygiene, hang out, do a class or something, and that's completely fine. We want to be able to build those relationships so that when they do decide they want to make a change, we have that trust built with them and they know to come to us and they know that we're going to be able to help them. Um, our clients are in the contemplation phase, contem contemplation and decision stage, um, 
they're more usually one foot in, one foot out, haven't quite decided, but they know that they want to change in their life. They may not know how to do that, but they recognize that they are hurting and they're not um, content where they are and they need help to get out of that place. And so we have those clients in our case management program, which is myself and another case manager work with them one-on-one -on -one to help them set goals and figure out the practical steps they need to take to reach those goals. It's a very intensive case management, so we're not just giving them a phone number that they may or may not call. We're sitting down with them, calling with them, introducing them to people, getting them connected to the resources that they really need. Um, if you go back real quick, sorry. So the reason that this um, is in a circular pattern is a lot of times it's not just a one-time exit. Um, the, the average is it takes somebody seven times to go through this cycle before the, they exit the life. But we like to think of it as the circle going up. So each time they make that circle again, they're getting closer to that exit. Um, so we will be right there if, they, if they've been working with us for months and they make that exit and, and they have a job and an apartment and then they relapse, we're going to be right there ready for them when they're back in that pre-contemplation stage and wherever they want to go from there. Um, obviously our goal is for an exit, but like I said before, we're going to meet people where they're at and help them at the stage that they're at. So the next one. So before I mentioned, I had mentioned the phases, this is a breakdown of our phases. Our phase one clients are our engagement clients. So these are the ones who are in that pre-contemplation stage. Like I said, they're just coming in to get those basic needs met, um, to just meet with staff briefly, get um, basic li living um, essentials, get referrals, things like that. We help a lot with IDs. Uh, a lot of people do not have IDs, and if you don't have an ID, there's very little other things that you can access. So that's usually our first point uh, where we start is getting an ID. Phase two, that's our intensive case management program. So like I said, we're setting goals, getting case coordination, linking them to services. Um, with this program, there's an educational scholarship available. If they are completing classes and following through with our empowerment program, then they can get a scholarship of up to $1,500 for continued education. Uh, we will help with housing deposits, we have a mentorship program, we'll provide legal advocacy, things like that. And then our phase three is our newest phase, and these are for clients who have exited the life and are in a maintenance or transition phase. So we're just helping them um, maintain their stability and kind of keep their support network going. Uh, we'll provide different programs, like there's Re the Rebecca Bender Elevate Academy, which teaches survivors how to use their story as a platform. Um, and we have a survivor leadership development program where we have sur survivor leaders coming into the center and working alongside staff in volunteer positions. Next one. So some of the services that we do provide, case management, counseling. We have our counselor come in with um, shield bearers every Wednesday. We offer job readiness and GED support. Ending the Game is a really cool class that was designed by a survivor, and it really goes into the psychological lies that you're taught in the life, and it breaks those down. So it replaces those lies with truth. It replaces that you're only worth this much with you are priceless. And just really getting those truths in there um, in a really cool um, group setting way. So a way to also build that support network again. Um, we have a resting room if somebody wants to sleep. A lot of times people will just come in, get something to eat, and sleep all day. And we are perfectly happy with that because they may not have been able to sleep for a couple days. Um, we offer lockers, which is another way to build trust with our clients. They can leave important documents there. They can leave money there. Um, and we assure them that it won't be touched. It'll be their locker and their space. And then, of course, basic things, computers, food, uh, phone, fo food, clothing, and hygiene, all that good stuff, too. Because uh, you're not going to be able to do much case management if someone hasn't eaten a meal in two days. So you want to get those things uh, taken care of first. So the next slide. So some of the outreach we do, most of our clients hear about us from word of mouth. So it's one person comes in, they tell their friends, who tell their friends, and that's how the majority of our clients find us. But we also do outreach. So we'll go out on the Bissonette Street about two times a month. Um, we go with the security detail who kind of hangs back so it doesn't look like we're 
we got the police following us. Um, and so we'll go along the street and we'll just talk to who we meet out there, let them know where we are. Like I said, we're in a big um, office building, so we can just point to it and let people know where to come to get those services. Um, but it's really another part of just building those relationships and meeting people, letting people know that there are options available. Uh, we go to muni municipal court. So if somebody receives a misdemeanor for a prostitution-related offense, they have the opportunity to meet with us. And by doing so, in joining our program, they can get that, that uh, misdemeanor dismissed um, and taken care of so that it's not on their record. Uh, we, law enforcement operations, we go along with them and we'll participate with them, being able to talk to the people that we encounter on those, um, just giving them more resources and things like that as well. And then ACTS, that's our program that we do in Harris County Jail. So the ending the game class that I talked about earlier, we take that to the jail. So we talk to the women there who may be locked up for prostitution or may be locked up for something else but have had prostitution or trafficking in their life at some point, and we bring that class to them there. Um, and then awareness, events like this, um, not a number. Most of the work we do is on the aftercare side. So they've already experienced the trafficking, they've experienced the trauma. Not a number is something that we do by going into the schools and teaching a curriculum to them that helps them understand the vulnerabilities that each and all of us have that may put them at risk for trafficking. So we wanna help them identify those so that they aren't exploited. Uh, really cool program that we're able to do. So this fancy cursive writing that's really hard to read says drop in visits trend all time. So don't worry about the reading, just if you just see that the slope is going up since our inception, um, it's just continued to grow. We've just seen continued um, growth in all aspects of our program from drop-in visits to clients, uh, the total number of clients and the services we're able to provide. Uh, if you go to the next one. So just some of our numbers. We've served total, I think it's 471, maybe. Yes, 471 clients. Uh, we just had another client today, so 472. Um, we've had, I can't, I don't memorize these numbers, 6,334 drop-in visits, um, and I believe 21,425 services provided in the three and a half years that we've been open. Um, of, so the identification piece that I talked about before, of those 471 clients we have, 281 of them have been identified as sex trafficking, 176 have been identified as commercial sex, nine for labor trafficking, and we have 36 clients who are currently out of the life. So a lot of times somebody will come in and their initial story is they'll say, I'm involved in prostitution, or they'll recognize that they're part of the commercial sex industry. And the more we get to talk to them, the more we hear their story, we realize they are victims of sex trafficking, and they may not know that term, but by us being able to tell them what's happened to them and be able to tell them the services that are available to them, we're able to increase that identification number. That's how we do that. Um, so if you keep going. This is just a breakdown of ethnicity. Majority is African American and then Caucasian, uh, biracial, Hispanic, and we have some Asian as well. We serve 85% of our clients are female. We serve transgender clients as well and then males. Um, and our age is very, our age is very um, broad. We've got lots of different ages. Um, a lot of our clients are older, but they were trafficked as a minor. And so they may only see themselves as, as um, a prostitute. That may be their view of their life, but we can help them understand what the exploitation that happened to them and the things that have happened to them that um, got them to that place. So if you keep going, I think we're almost done here. So fighting trafficking, um, what can y'all do in this? Go to the next one. So we have a training on Saturday, May 11th. That's coming up. That's our next training. Um, you're welcome to attend this. You can sign up on our website. Um, this will open you up to all of our volunteer opportunities in the drop-in center. You can go on outreach with us. I'll have all this information on the table as well. Um, and then if you go one more. The biggest thing that you can do is pray with us. If you want to text this number, it'll send out. It's our prayer text. And so they'll send out different prayer requests we have for clients. Um, this is our this is our main weapon in fighting this, and so we don't want to take this lightly. This is really how we get things done. Um, it's not by us, but by God. So we just want to make sure that we are praying for people and being able to get those. Um, I think that's it. And then here's just some numbers in case 
Uh, if you want to take a picture of that, you're welcome to. But that's it.